So the previous solutions were aimed at improving access for our most vulnerable and underserved populations. But what about oral health policy changes that affect all Americans? In this final portion of today's session, I'm going to talk about the future in U.S. oral health. But to talk about the future, we have to revisit the past. As described by Dr. Wendy Meradian from the University of Washington at the recent Gidden Lectureship at HSDM, the separation between the two professions was not entirely problematic as it allowed dental to take a predominant role of its own. However, there were also consequences of this divide, consequences to the students, the institutions, and finally, to the patients. The integration or bridging of medical and dental is not a new idea. It was recommended in 1926 as part of the Guy's Report on Dental Education. So is the solution to merge dental and medical schools? Most would say no, not a complete merger. The overarching solution is to reconnect the mouth to the body. Not only is the disconnect between oral and systemic health impacting access to care for vulnerable and underserved populations, but it is a separate challenge of the oral health care system on its own. As Dr. Tavares illustrated, there's been a historic divide between medicine and dentistry. This divide evolved into how physicians and dentists are trained, trained separately in most cases, how oral health care is covered and paid for, completely different insurances, and for how oral health does not join or is often not considered by legislatures in healthcare policy decisions. For example, dentistry stayed out of Medicare in 1965 and was brought in late to the Affordable Care Act discussions. But why is the disconnect important? The 2000 Surgeon General's report on oral health was a pivotal piece for two reasons. It highlighted the oral health disparities among vulnerable and underserved communities, and it emphasized the connection between oral health and general health. The report noted that the mouth is a mirror into the body signaling any changes in health, and that dentists can play an important role in their patients' overall health care. A common risk factor approach framework developed by Shyam and Watt beautifully illustrates the connection between risk factors common between oral and systemic diseases. For example, an individual's dietary choices are a risk factor for developing tooth decay, obesity, diabetes, cancers, and cardiovascular disease. So what does this mean? One area where medicine and dentistry have been bridging the gap is in research. Researchers have been studying the relationship between general health and oral health. There appears to be a relationship between oral health or oral hygiene and different systemic conditions. For example, the relationship of periodontal disease and diabetes has the strongest evidence, demonstrating that the risk of periodontitis is higher in individuals with diabetes. Although the effect of periodontitis on glycemic control is less clear, Many experts agree that improving oral health indices can positively impact systemic health. We'll see how some organizations have oper operationalized this perspective. Furthermore, studies had found a relationship between periodontitis and adverse birth outcomes. Although the causal association results have been mixed, it led to policy efforts at the local, state, and federal level to encourage pregnant women to visit the dentist and led many state Medicaid offices to put back previously deleted adult benefits for pregnant women. So in thinking about the challenges in the oral health care system due to the disconnect and how it created separate systems of education, care, delivery, and financing, what does it mean? Why not leave dentistry to continue on its own? As evidenced by the interconnectedness between oral and systemic health, more and more voices, like our own dean at HSDM, insurance companies like United Healthcare, and foundations like DentiQuest Foundation, are talking about reconstructing the divide for the overall benefit of all Americans, improving their health 
and reducing health care costs. Several educational policies and institutions for training undergraduate and postgraduate dental students have embraced the idea of medical and dental integration. Here at Harvard, undergraduate dental and medical students have long taken their first two years of coursework together. The University of Washington Dental School is looking at ways to expand integration of their dental and medical student courses. In partnership between the Cambridge Health Alliance and the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, postgraduate dental students can take a general practice residency to build their skills for providing or overseeing complete dental care and aspects of primary care, including taking vital signs, screening for diabetes and other major health problems, and administering vaccines. The program hopes to educate dentists who can adapt to the changing health needs of today's most vulnerable populations by increasing early disease detection and referral. This idea is echoed in federal policy, such as the Healthy People 2020 objectives describing the role of the dentist in primary care, particularly their role in screening for diseases and referral. And lastly, with changing accreditation standards, some medical and dental schools are examining best practices for educating their students, including considering patient-centered care, cultural competency, professionalism and ethics, and interprofessionalism and communication. But while changing the educational landscape is necessary, it is not sufficient. Some organizations have developed and instituted changes to how they deliver care. In Wisconsin, Marshfield Clinics have integrated their medical and dental electronic health records in an effort to improve the care provided to their patients, particularly patients with risk factors for comorbid conditions such as periodontal disease, diabetes, and obesity. This type of integrated care ensures a holistic approach to treating patients and recognizes the importance of oral health to systemic health. There has also been a tremendous amount of discussion around developing interprofessional models of practice, with some organizations instituting these models in office and clinic settings. For example, dental hygienists are being employed with pediatric offices in Colorado and public health departments, particularly WIC clinics in Oregon. For segments of our population, incorporating oral health services into well-defined protocols such as well-child checks and certification for WIC vouchers, dentistry is better able to reach people. And lastly, at the University of British Columbia in Canada, pharmacy students have been integrated into the dental clinics to review patient medication lists, an approach that may become more and more necessary as our aging population has more complex and chronic medical issues. Innovative approaches like these deliver on the interconnectedness and interprofessional nature of healthcare and another way to bridge the divide between medicine and dentistry. And lastly, insurance organizations have begun to study approaches to integrate medicine and dentistry. These approaches are examples of innovative, cost-saving strategies that impact not only vulnerable populations, that is those with chronic diseases, the elderly, but can improve the health of all Americans. I think that these are some of the most exciting solutions as changing the structure of insurance coverage is such a monumental task. What these approaches highlight is not whether the health of their insured population has improved, but whether there were significant reductions in medical costs among the insured. And with a continued escalation of medical costs, approaches that can reduce costs and com provide complete integrated care to patients should be recognized. United Healthcare found that for 2010 data from its members with chronic medical conditions, those thought to be linked to good oral health, that dental treatment was associated with lower medical costs for members with chronic conditions. They also found that the greatest cost differences were for patients who were compliant with medical and dental recommendations and that dental engagement or visits appeared to positively impact all conditions studied. Additionally, 
diabetics were most impacted by periodontal treatment. In Massachusetts, Blue Cross Blue Shield provides integrated medical and oral health coverage with the aim of improving oral health outcomes and removing cost barriers to oral health care among its most vulnerable beneficiaries. Beneficiaries with diabetes, coronary artery disease, oral cancer, and women who are pregnant that have both medical and dental coverage are automatically enrolled in a program that provides enhanced dental benefits. These individuals are eligible to receive additional services such as cleanings or periodontal maintenance every three months at no additional cost based on their condition. According to claims data, this approach has lowered medical costs among participants with diabetes and coronary artery disease. It has been 14 years since the 2000 Surgeon General's report on oral health where we learned that segments of our society were still living with the devastations from oral health diseases and the interconnectedness between oral and gem general health that the mouth is a mirror to the body. We've made some progress with some of the innovative solutions from organizations, institutions, and grassroots efforts described here and many others not mentioned, but we still have a long way to go to recognize DentaQuest Foundation's vision for 2020 of oral health for all. Thank you.